have some other things to go into here? Um, no, the only, I had a you know, quick disclaimer. There are going to be some questions I know everyone on this call wants to know. Um, for instance, the valuation, how much or have we raised? Uh, you know, all that information can be found on the Start Engine uh, raise page. I will add the Start Engine link right here in the, in the chat below. Um, so yeah, and like David mentioned at the end, we will be answering questions. So feel free throughout this whole webinar, leave your questions below and we'll be sure to, to get through them at the end of this webinar. Sounds good. Uh, so with that, uh, uh, could you, um, let's see, I'm trying to do a share screen here. Do you need to enable that for me, Khalil? I think you have the ability. There's a oh, there we go. Okay. Okay. So this is our regular presentation deck. And uh, once again, I'm David Colleen, CEO and co-founder of Sapient Dex. And our software is uh, AI powered and it's geared for living inside of our customers' products to enable them to have a, a voice interface for the product. And, uh, and also to add some intelligence to that, that product. We're a little bit different than, than other things like Siri and Alexa. Um, I won't say better or worse, uh, but uh, Siri and Alexa were born to uh, do simple uh, keyword-based interactions with people to uh, tell you the weather or what time it is or to play music for you. Uh, we have a little more ambitious goal and that is our feeling is that if we could make a system that is fully conversational, that people could ask more complex things of their devices and never have to learn commands in order to use them. They could just tell the product what it is that they wanted. So uh, uh, by the way, I've got two founders, uh, uh, Bruce and Macklin. Bruce for fun uh, competes in the Loebner Awards each year and uh, he's won it four times. Uh, that's uh, a test that administers the, the Turing test to, um, uh, to conversational systems. And uh, he's, uh, he's been fortunate enough to win it four times so far. Uh, Bruce and Macklin uh, are my co-founders. Uh, I come from, um, uh, from a business background and, um, and a 3D background, worked uh, developing a lot of uh, different products, everything from virtual places to talking characters. But uh, Bruce joined, uh, joined our team um, uh, back in 2008 to add a, a voice capability to a navigation system that we're developing for the automotive industry. And uh, Bruce comes from a game background and uh, he did the ground up uh, right of our uh, very first voice system. And uh, he's still working with us uh, to this day. Uh, Macklin Marvitt joined us a little bit later. We had known, uh, both Bruce and I had known Macklin for a very long time. He literally is a rocket scientist. Uh, he was working on Jeff Bezos's rocket. Uh, but I think more importantly, he is a person who, um, uh, whose background was in building large engineering teams, which is very important to, to what we're doing. Uh, a little bit about the product. Um, so products like Siri and Alexa, because they're just keyword based, only understand about three quarters of the things that you say to them. Uh, we're different. Um, in our internal testing, uh, we get up to 99% accuracy. That means if we say something, the system understands us almost all the time. And it turns out for certain customers, like if you're driving your car and you want the lights turned on, you want that to happen every single time, not three out of four times. So uh, that's an important factor for a lot of our customers. Second thing is um, all the main voice products that you know only exist in the world for one purpose. That's to collect your sensitive user data and sell it. We don't do that. That's really important to our customer base and uh, a big distinguishing factor for, uh, for our company. The other thing is um, there's wonderful things being done in the world of AI, uh, like GPT-3. Uh, GPT-3, what they never tell you in the press articles is it runs on a $200,000 computer. We're busy making systems that uh, can run on something as simple as your wristwatch 
And uh, to do that, we have to do very careful old school programming uh, so that the system's very efficient. Uh, the Googles and Amazon Alexas of the world run on supercomputers, and that's another reason they need the internet is uh, they just literally would never run on your home device. Uh, we also speak a, a, an awful lot of languages, uh, whereas some of the other products they, you may be familiar, familiar with, like IBM Watson, only speak 13 languages, we speak 40. And uh, we're all about our customer. We're not trying to impose our brand on top of our customer as the other products are. So we're able to customize the, uh, uh, the wake word, the, the character and how they interact with people. And uh, with our company, avatars are optional, but almost all of our customers go for it. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, we're able to make that avatar look like any kind of brand ambassador that our customer wants. So uh, going back to the differences between systems, uh, a lot of the early systems uh, evolved out of IVR, which is uh, the systems that were built into the phones to answer very basic questions. And all the main systems in purple there started there. Uh, there are more modern systems like SoundHound that were also web-based and Nuance and Serence that were more efficient, but they also uh, were lower uh, in accuracy in our testing, uh, quite low for some of them. Uh, there was a JD Power study done of uh, voice assistants in American cars, and they found on average, they were 37% accurate, which is just terrible. And it's why most people don't use the voice system that, that comes built into their car. Uh, for us, we think we offer the best of everything that is high accuracy and low power. So we can go to other places that the others can't. And by the way, we run online or offline and you're hearing Mr. P in the background, uh, the, the peacock here on our ranch. So sorry, he's interrupting. Raise your hand next time, Mr. P. Okay. Um, so looking at the, the competitive analysis in a little bit more detailed uh, fashion, um, only a handful of us offer white label experiences. That's important for our customers. Uh, speaking a lot of languages, if you're trying to put a voice assistant into a car, you need to be prepared to speak whatever language they sell those cars into. So uh, we speak 40 directly uh, to, uh, to service uh, the customer needs. Uh, working offline, there's only a couple of us that can even work offline. And uh, once again, we're the only ones that protect uh, user data. We just don't sell it. We think that's, uh, that's a bad business. And uh, we top uh, uh, all, all of them in, in accuracy in our own testing and in testing that other third parties uh, have done. So uh, we think we've got a solid product and it's important that we get it out there and, and uh, bring it to customers. Uh, you can see uh, we're speaking languages all over the world. These are where our customers sell their products. Uh, if they start selling them into another country that's important, we'll add new languages. Uh, our work so far has been uh, with uh, significant, uh, significant companies. Uh, we've done roughly 30 uh, prototypes or proof of concepts with, uh, with our customer base. Nothing has reached the consumer yet. And uh, next week will be the first time that we're reaching uh, uh, a, a public audience with our, with our work. So that's why next week's so important to us. Let me circle back to that though. Uh, our early work was with the car companies and uh, we worked with a number of uh, important people. You see their logos down below, developing prototypes for their cars. A lot of this work got put on hold when COVID began, uh, not just because of COVID, but because of chip shortages uh, and uh, other supply chain issues that hit the automotive uh, industry hard. So uh, to this day, uh, the car companies can't sell all the cars that they have demand for uh, just because there's not enough parts. Uh, so that has really diminished the R&D activities of our friends that make cars. And, uh, and limited our ability to penetrate that market. That said, in the past year, we've, uh, we've done important projects with both Murakami, uh, 
who is a, a big parts supplier in Japan, and they've had us build a system where uh, our little avatars went into the mirror of your car to uh, give you driving directions and play music for you and so on. And uh, we also worked with Visteon in Detroit, who's the largest U.S. Uh, auto parts supplier, and they sell parts to uh, uh, car makers all around the world. Uh, we did important uh, prototypes with them, and they're busy out there trying to sell those solutions to their customer base. But other than that, uh, the, the car industry has been a little sleepy the past two years. Uh, one of the newest areas for us is, uh, is in digital signage. Five years ago, we brought uh, Alex Hessler out of Pixar. Uh, he literally worked on the Avatar movie um, and uh, things like Harry Potter and other movies that you know well. Uh, we brought Tim onto the team because we knew that uh, that our work on small screens needed to be scaled up to larger screens to serve certain customer needs, such as uh, retailing or assistance that would be in a showroom or in a vending machine. It was a lot of work um, to make uh, realistic characters that could walk and talk and interact with people in a human-like way. And uh, we began to first show that uh, uh, last fall uh, publicly uh, with the, the character in the middle that uh, we call Sage. Um, and uh, more recently with the character that you see over my shoulder for, for next week, Xander. Uh, Xander is an important part of, uh, of what we're doing and where we think uh, uh, an important future market is for us by selling characters that can uh, inform people. Um, Next month, we're going to be working on a system to go into the Edmonton airport with a character that can tell you uh, which baggage carousel to pick up your luggage or where your connecting flight is or something as simple as where's the bathroom. Uh, we have uh, proposals uh, with uh, 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 train stations. Uh, we have also done uh, a prototype with Lowe's for a greeter that when you walk into the store, uh, the character will greet you and say, can I help you find anything? And if you say, um, uh, I'd, I'd like to, uh, you know, a certain, uh, a certain tool, he can tell you exactly which aisle to go to. Uh, we have also worked with uh, two partners so far on systems to go into vending machines. And actually the very first one, oddly enough, was for, uh, for Amazon to dispense COVID supplies to their uh, warehouse workers. And uh, so you just uh, go up to the vending machine, uh, give your uh, email address, your company email address to the character, um, who is Amazon Amy, by the way, AMI. And uh, Amy will say, okay, well, here's your free COVID mask or safety vest or whatever else she's dispensing. Uh, so we've also done uh, proposals for things like Citizen Watch, watches, uh, to dispense watches um, for, um, uh, Disney uh, for their theme parks and for cruise lines and uh, banking systems in Germany. Uh, a number of uses were in proposals for us. So we're very actively trying to get uh, our characters uh, conversing with people in a number of different settings and either informing them or selling them something or, uh, uh, or helping them in, in, in some way. Other areas that we're working on uh, have been smart homes. Uh, we developed a prototype for uh, for NEC uh, for their Magic Mirror uh, product line, which unfortunately has been canceled now. Uh, Samsung for their TVs group, and we've worked with uh, three different robot man manufacturers so far. And uh, uh, as a marketplace, um, smart home devices are have been depressed actually during COVID. You might think it would be just the opposite with us uh, spending a lot of time at home that. Uh, uh, that uh, sales would be up, but they're actually pretty flat. Uh, the past two years, the growth rate of these uh, products has been just 2%. So um, uh, it's an important market, but one that uh, uh, we're not seeing strong results on um, uh, this year. So the other area that we've had some forays into is health. Uh, that market is also moving fairly slowly. We think it is filled with promise. Uh, one of the things I liked the most was our development of the Hazel character for Yamaha. Uh, they were opening up a new product line to service uh, senior care facilities with a companion uh, kitty cat 
that, uh, uh, that could befriend seniors, but also measure their cognitive abilities and report to their health team um, changes in their, their abilities, either cognitive uh, improvements or declines. So I think that's an important future market for us, but uh, the key word is future market. Uh, it's not something that, uh, that uh, we're selling uh, much product into at this point. Uh, so we're going to continue to uh, to monitor the health market um, until it's uh, it's ready for robust sales. Uh, speaking of markets and uh, revenue models, most of uh, most of the customers that we interface with um, want uh, licensing of our product uh, based on per unit sales. The predictions for the voice market are, uh, by the analysts are quite good, showing a $32 billion market. It's a sizable market in the next few years. We think we can uh, potentially access about $5 billion worth of that. So that's a very worthwhile market for us, and it's, it's growing rapidly at uh, uh, for nearly 44%. Uh, so that's an important uh, uh, contributing factor to us, uh, our feeling that we can be successful in the future with this. It's a vibrant market and, uh, and moving very quickly right now. Uh, I won't go into these details in this call, but uh, we also, by the way, do SaaS models for, uh, uh, for some of our customer proposals. Uh, as you probably know, we're in the middle of a, a $4.2 million raise at uh, Start Engine. I won't go into too much of the detail of this. I'm happy to answer questions about it, but uh, that's not so much the point of the call right now. And I'll talk about the exit because uh, some of you want to know what our exit plans are. Day-to-day, uh, -day, our focus as a business is to make a really good company and, a, and an excellent product. Uh, but as part of our competitive analysis, we also track peer companies. Um, 35 of them in particular. And uh, since we began, we've noticed that 27 of them have been acquired. And uh, you may be aware of some of these deals. You can see that the frequent flyers are Microsoft and Apple and companies like that acquiring uh, AI companies left and right. It's been a very vibrant market. Uh, will we get acquired? Time will tell. Uh, but when these companies have gotten acquired, it's after they've been in business for roughly six years. And for every dollar in, that their investors put into the company, on average, they got $14 back, which is wonderful. Uh, if we could do that for our investors, we would all be very, very happy. And we're all in this together. Uh, hopefully, we'll have a, a wonderful day. And of course, we can't uh, guarantee any of that, but we're working very hard to make all that uh, that happen. Uh, people also want to know if um, if we plan to IPO, and really, that's dependent upon the IPO market or SPAC market at the at the time. Uh, but I will tell you something that was a bit of a surprise to me. I think everybody assumes that IPOs make the most money for investors, and that's actually not true in our space. Uh, we did some research on this uh, through uh, 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 CB Insights and uh, found that uh, actually getting acquired generated roughly twice as much money for investors as a company that IPO'd. And that's very sobering. So we want the highest orbit for the, the company. We want to get our products to as many people as is possible. And uh, uh, that may best happen by being part of a larger company that has more resources and more established sales channels to, uh, to move product through. So uh, th that's a little summary of where we are. Uh, that's our investor deck. Uh, let me stop the share on that for now. And uh, uh, we're, once again, we're going to be taking questions in just a minute. So th thank you for your patience as I've been rambling on here so far. Uh, but what what I'd like to do is take you behind the curtains and see things that the team has been working on. Uh, the version of Sander, by the way, is from, uh, from a month ago. And uh, early in prototyping with a new character, we don't bother with the scene and all the fancy stuff. So he's really just uh, kind of a bare bones character uh, that, uh, that the team uses for uh, voice um, um, 
uh, interactions and testing and, uh, and and the like, getting a character ready to uh, uh, be used by a customer. Let me just swing over for a second, and I hope you all can still hear me. How's it going today? Great, thanks. So this one has uh, this character has a had a Brit has a British accent. What do you do? I'm a good listener, and I can answer many of your questions. You, you can also see he's not perfect. This is a test character from from last month. How do I use you? Just by telling me what you want. My name's David. Hello, David. I'm happy to know your name. What's my name? Your name is David. What's your name? My name is Sander. So I'm going to take uh, the test version of Sander down, shut that down, and show you a version that the team has been working on for the show next week. That, uh, that just arrived today. Okay. Take just a second to load here. So something that's important here, let me turn the, the audio down a little bit. So what was that? So this is the, the Xander character that, that you just saw a moment ago. And by the way, uh, pardon me, my office is a mess here. We've been working so hard. Uh, this is an 85 inch flat screen that we're able to put into a store or a bank or or uh, an airport. And uh, the show next week is the Augmented World Expo. It's the biggest show of the year for the augmented reality and virtual reality community. So that's why we have very game looking characters. Uh, you can see a mistake in this version. Uh, they shrank Xander. So now he's shorter than the other characters. Uh, they're gonna be uh, fixing some of the last little minute issues. But uh, I just think this is uh, astoundingly uh, beautiful work that the team has has done. The, the scene looks very much like Blade Runner, and the characters are detailed, and uh, Xander interacts with people. I hope some of you can come to the show next week and, and see this uh, in person once it's finished. Uh, also, if you walk um, up to Xander at the show, and start talking with him, he'll have general conversation with you. But if you ask, for instance, uh, where's uh, the Safety and X booth, he'll say, um, uh, it's, at, uh, it's at booth number 819, and he brings up an interactive map, and we have an, an automatic um, mapping system built into this application to give people directions at the show. So Xander um, will be in the public uh, lobby at the AWE show next week. Uh, we'll be sending out a press release on this on Monday. So you're literally seeing this before anybody else. And, uh, um, and it's very exciting for us. Uh, the whole team's been working super hard on, uh, on this to get it out there. And our theory is the more trade shows that we can put uh, conversational characters like this into, the more Fortune 500 companies will see this and want uh, a character like Xander or uh, something looking uh, a little more corporate or more like their, uh, the brand experience that they want to express to their customers. Uh, we can customize these characters to look and talk like, uh, like anyone, including famous people, if that's, uh, if that's what they want. So um, the more we put these at trade shows, I think the more business we're going to generate. And uh, I believe this is going to be an important new part of, uh, of uh, what we're doing and, and how we're building business in the, uh, in the company. So that is my presentation for today. 
uh, we're about halfway through our, our one hour session. So I'd, I'd love to spend uh, time talking to each of you individually. And the way Khalil runs this is if you put your hand up, uh, we're going to have you go on uh, live on a microphone mm -hmm. and, uh, and ask your questions and, uh, and hopefully not stump me. I hate it when I get stumped. It doesn't happen very often, but, but do your best. I'm here for you. We have a uh, question from Dina here. I'm going to allow Dina to. Hey, Dina. Hi, I'm uh, actually in Brisbane, Australia. So. Hey, Dina, thanks for calling all the way in from Australia. Well, it's not the, it, it, the problem is what time of day it is. It's a little bit early here, but I wanted to know about the characters. Is anyone keeping track of, of how uh, appealing a character is to the people who come up? Because I'm looking at those, those characters that you have, and I know that if I walk past any of those three, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be drawn to them. Well, so, so it, it, it's a good question, and let me hit it, hit it head on. Um, the right character for the right uh, customer is, is what we're trying to achieve uh, uh, for the, the companies that we're working with. Now, this, uh, this show that we're in next week is a bunch of people that come out of the game industry. And, ah, okay. And these characters are good to being appealing to, to them. Now, uh, another point that I haven't mentioned about these characters is uh, sometimes we're asked if we sell avatars and the answer is no. Uh, we, all three of these characters and the, the 3D scene, I'd love to take credit for them. They're beautiful, but really they're off the shelf components available to somebody who is a game developer or a game artist. And that's part of the point we make. Xander is, uh, is from Epic's MetaHuman collection. Uh, the woman on the on my on the right there is uh, is from an Unreal Four character base, and uh, the other woman is from a company called Turbo Squid that th sells three D models to the that artist community. Our point is we're we're powering them with AI to give them a voice, but also to give them animation, and these are things that uh, game developers need. Uh, whether they're building a game or building a product infer interface for, for Disney, uh, they need these technologies that we're making. And that's, that's our point in the show. Thank you. And thanks for asking a good question. Who do we have next there, Khalil? Uh, Khalil, you're on mute there. Oh, there he is. <laughs> There we go. We have MK. Hey, MK, where are you calling in from? Hey, guys. Hey, how are you? Um, I'm calling in from uh, Vegas, and I, I, I heard you say gaming. And, you know, in the gaming industry here, we've had for many years a, uh, a game like a, um, like a blackjack game with one of these characters that's similar to what you got you know, looking at you as you walk by. But the thing is, and they look realistic, but the thing is, I, after they finish talking, you can see a little glitch going and then they, you know, repeat over. I don't see that with these, uh, with these characters. I mean, they look, you know, I, I'm not up front, but I, I suppose they probably look so, so nice. So, you know, so real, like, you know, like, a, a, like they can step out the screen. Uh, but uh, I love it. I love what you're doing. I just only wish that I was able to uh, invest more money at the time. So is there a chance down the road we could keep on investing? Yeah. So um, you've got a couple of questions there. Let me hit them one by one. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, we hope to invest, uh, open up investment uh, in the uh, in the future. Startups uh, need growth capital, so they uh, typically keep coming back to their investor base. And we have people that have invested three or four times with us over the years. So it's pretty cool when you see somebody who um, thinks enough of us to, uh, to to join us as part of our investor team, but then they keep coming back because they see and appreciate what we're doing and, and believe that, uh, that that's going to make uh, 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 it a good investment for them. So I, I'd love to see that. Uh, let me talk about these characters. Uh, the, 
I did see the characters that you're talking about the last time I was in Las Vegas at CES back in January. Those systems use video clips. And at first that looks good, but when you start looking closely, you see the seams and they can only do what we call an on the rails presentation. That is, it's tightly scripted and it takes you down a, a set path of interaction with people. Our characters can literally do anything because they're not video clips. These are actually 3D characters. So I could take you for a walk and we could walk around them and see them from behind. And uh, uh, in the next version of this, we're going to uh, have voice uh, interactions where we can say, walk over there, bend over and pick up a quarter off of the pavement or, or whatever. And these characters can do that. And those video based systems will never do that. So. Uh, we're pushing those older video-based systems out of the way uh, with, uh, with these new abilities. And we're the only ones that I know of that, uh, that are uh, doing this and busy selling this at the moment. Uh, maybe there'll be more soon. Um, I should tell you that two years ago at CES, uh, Samsung uh, showed what they called the NEON project and they promised to deliver something uh, similar to what we were showing here. However, it didn't actually work. Uh, parts of it worked and uh, they would have to, for instance, turn off the animation in order to talk to the system. And when you would talk to the system, the reporters ask questions like, how are you? And the character would say, I like pizza. Uh, Google it, it's pretty, fat, uh, <laughs> pretty funny to watch. They're beautiful characters. <laughs> but they, they, they couldn't talk to people in any kind of meaningful, useful way. So mm -hmm. thanks for asking about that, MK. Fantastic. I am very, very happy to be involved. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, who do we have next, sir, Khalil? We have Peter. Hey, Peter, how's everything in Sweden? Uh, Peter, you're yeah. on the I, uh, I am an investor and uh, uh, I have also talking to a startup company in Sweden doing uh, voice AI and uh, I have a technology uh, question uh, regarding conversational AI and uh, your uh, okay. uh, uh, I, I've talked to them and uh, they tell me that they are actually hard code a lot of uh, things regarding uh, if you uh, say something wrong in uh, your dialogue, uh, then they uh, manually do a hard coding to to uh, deal with the, those errors. And I, I want to know if you uh, have a scalable and and easy to develop uh, solution um, in your uh, code. Yeah, so I, I know you come from a programming background, uh, and for just a second, I'm going to get a little geeky maybe for the others, but uh, uh, the older systems are hard-coded, so one line of code might, um, might be used for a question like, uh, how's the weather today, and it would have a hard-coded response of saying, the, the weather's beautiful today. Uh, our system is a lot more flexible. Um, if you ask that same question, uh, our system can hit a weather database and then say, oh, Peter's in Sweden, uh, in Gothenburg or wherever you are, and say, oh, the weather in Gothenburg is, uh, is the following. So we have a, the ability to be a lot more flexible. But also because we break things down um, and analyze the language very deeply, we're able to write one line of code that can answer a thousand different questions. That makes us very efficient and scalable. So uh, probably most of you won't understand or appreciate the value of this, but our complete core conversational system is 14,000 lines of code, which is tiny uh, compared to something like Alexa, we're, we're this big but it's also why we can run on a wristwatch is our code is very compact and efficient and lets us uh, uh, go to places that the others can't. Does that, does that answer your question okay, Peter? Yeah, that sounds really interesting. And uh, uh, I'm looking forward, uh, uh, I've sent the question to you earlier that 
uh, I, I want uh, to uh, be able to have some kind of demo that I can access. Uh, so I, I hope, uh, hoping that you soon can uh, make me have uh, access to some. Yes. So um, for those of you that uh, that I haven't told this uh, to, uh, we had hoped to open up our beta program for all of you to begin testing the system. Uh, we had hoped to do that this month, but when the opportunity came up to uh, make characters for the AWE show and literally have our first customer exposure uh, and public interface for our characters, we pushed the beta program uh, release back a little bit. Uh, the team's going to be back working on the beta uh, release for June, so I'm hoping that we can get something by late in June out to you to begin testing. So uh, thank you for, for mentioning that, and also thank you for your patience. Uh, the, the beta participation is not just a, a reward for you folks that have invested in us, but also it's a way for you to uh, torture test the system and help us to learn where there's any kind of uh, uh, frailties in the system. Uh, it, longer term, we plan to uh, put a full, uh, publicly available uh, system where you can test characters, but we want you to test it first and help us together to make the system better before we make that more general public release. So Peter, thank you so much. Taksimika. Thank you. Great. Thank you. <laughs> uh, who do we have next, Khalil? Yes, let me check right here. We, I don't want to butcher this name, so I'm going to let <laughs> this person uh, uh, say their name. I am giving them talking permissions right now. All right, thank you. I'm David. Hi. Hello. First of all, how, how can I pronounce your name so I don't do a bad job? <laughs> yeah, yeah Ulu and David. I'm from Nigeria, actually. Hey, thank you very much for, for, uh, uh, for calling in from Nigeria. Wow. <laughs> yeah, thanks a lot. Um, good evening. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can. Thank you. All right. I really want to say this is an amazing project, and um, I'm happy to see that this there are provisions for about 40 languages in this project. Mine is actually a suggestion, and I think, or rather, want to ask if it's possible to um, take advantage of what's already made available by making this um, technology or actually making provision for this technology to translate between um, two languages. I don't know if, if there's any um, thoughts about that. I think that would make this technology much more valuable. Thank you. Uh, okay. Thank you for asking that question. And uh, uh, let me restate it in case some of you had difficulty hearing that. The, the question is, can our characters translate between two languages? And the answer is yes. Uh, but we have, uh, we've done some customer proposals for that already uh, using our uh, Zoom client. We had uh, one customer in Japan that wanted us to simultaneously translate everything in a meeting between Japanese and English. Uh, very often, uh, uh, we have, we've had a number of customers over the years in Japan, and uh, they're really astounded that... Uh, a company based in America can make a system that speaks Japanese. Uh, there's been a long held belief that, that that's impossible, but we show them otherwise. Uh, they want, uh, the company that we we're talking with was uh, SoftBank in Japan, and they wanted a meeting system that uh, uh, I could speak in English. And if there were people in Japan that couldn't understand English all that well, uh, that it would automatically translate my, my voice into Japanese for them. And when they speak Japanese back to me, I speak a little bit of Japanese, but not enough for a meeting. So if they could translate back to English to me, that would be a big win. Uh, that, uh, that work with SoftBank has not been funded yet. Uh, I, I hope it does get funded because I think it's really a wonderful sort of thing to offer Rosetta Stone for people around the world to communicate with each other. And uh, 
uh, Oluwasan, uh, we did a proposal for uh, a health company in Africa to do just that. And they explained to me that there were about 300 languages that they want to serve in Africa, which is an awful lot of languages. Uh, so far, we only speak uh, 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 Arabic and uh, English and French and Dutch. Uh, th that gets us a little bit of the way into Africa, but we've got a lot more work to do. Thank you. By, Thank by you. the way, by the way, the Xander character that you see behind me was inspired by a hip hop artist that, uh, that I met from Ghana last year. And uh, we talked about doing a project together. Uh, luckily for me, his English is perfect. <laughs> <laughs> so thank uh, you for that question. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Who, who do we have next, Khalil? Um, okay, so now we have some questions. Uh, Let's see, from Ralph. Ralph asks, how does rising interest rates and a possible slower economy affect Sapien X? And have you or your team had to deal with rising interest rates and or a slowing economy in your past business dealing? Okay, so let me talk about that. Um, you know, it's no surprise. We all watch the news. We all see a lot of predictions that we're entering a recession. Um, Nobody likes a recession. It's, it's, it, it means that any business goals that you have get delayed, and that can be frustrating for all of us, including people who are investing in, in companies. Uh, now, we can't change the world, but we can adapt to it. Uh, I would argue, to, argue that, in a way, uh, we have been through a recession the past two years. Um, maybe not technically a recession from a financial standpoint, but our customers were greatly affected by COVID and the chip shortage and supply chain issues. And that really impacted our ability to get out and sell our products. Now, I don't have a crystal ball. I don't know what the next couple of years are gonna hold uh, in terms of uh, investment, but uh, what good CEOs do, I believe at startups, is prepare for the storm and hopefully the storm doesn't come. Uh, the good news is at our current uh, financial burn rate, uh, the money that we have raised uh, with all of you at, uh, through the Start Engine raise will carry us for uh, a couple of years. Now, there are some important uh, reports that, uh, that I've read in the past few weeks suggesting that uh, uh, the downturn could be as long as two years. So we have raised uh, more than two years of, of capital. Uh, so in the worst case, and I'm talking about worst case, uh, we can continue, survive a recession and be in even better position to go out and claim uh, 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 sales in a, in a market that is more receptive to it. Uh, now, hopefully, some of these dire predictions are not going to be true and uh, we're going to be able to sell product. We're still rolling up our sleeves, diving in, working hard to sell every single day. And uh, uh, let, let's take during COVID. Um, we realized that our automotive work wasn't working very well. So we looked for markets that we could uh, sell into that uh, the uh, were not affected by chip shortages and, and COVID-related uh, downturns. So one of the things we did is developed a, a, a new system for vending machines to dispense COVID supplies by voice. Um, so good startups, I think, get creative. When the chips are down, they find new ways to create business. And uh, you can see uh, probably by my haircut and color of my hair, I've been through a few recessions and learn some important lessons about how to help a company thrive even under the worst of economic times. Um, by the way, our board meeting is tomorrow and the key topic tomorrow is to do planning for, uh, for high and low cases of different economic scenarios depending upon how the world markets uh, play out. Uh, so we are paying attention and we are prepared and we're gonna do our best for you uh, uh, in good times and bad. So. Thank you for being there th through uh, through those good times and bad times with us. 
Um, could we have a have a new question here? Yes. From Thank Jake. You. Jake asks, thinking about this from a training and education perspective, uh, would this technology be capable of integrating with a mixed reality or augmented reality system? Yes. Uh, so there's there's two questions in there. Jake, thanks for asking those. Uh, so uh, for for training application and some education, I think that uh, uh, those are uh, obviously great places to use this technology. Historically, the problem, though, is those have been underfunded industries. Uh, we would love to do things, for instance, with school kids. Uh, we did proposals uh, with a company in Chicago called Charlala that does uh, uh, Spanish language teaching to, uh, to American kids, and they wanted to use our characters to interact and teach Spanish. I love it. But the problem is, is they couldn't get enough funding to make it happen. And it's, it's sad. I wish it were different than that for our school kids. But uh, if we have a customer that wants to do something uh, for education or training, we're all over it. By the way, uh, we've made plans to um, show our work in Washington, D.C. for the first time in, uh, in October of this year. Uh, we're going to be at the Voice 22 show in Arlington. Uh, please come if you can. Uh, that's going to be our first exposure of these characters to um, to the whole Washington D.C. Uh, marketplace, which is largely government and, and military and intelligence. We have worked extensively in that community in the past. Actually, these characters began long ago for uh, uh, for DoD funded uh, research back in two thousand and three. So it would actually be bringing these characters home to them after all these years. Uh, now that, the reason I bring that up is they traditionally are strong funders for training. Uh, so perhaps we'll find some, uh, some new customers through uh, that exposure in October. Uh, thank you very much for asking that question though. Uh, it's an important area. Of course. And then Mark asks, what is the revenue model? How do you charge? Is this a one-time fee or a SaaS model? Also, what additional improvements do you see being made on the product after it's integrated? For example, what enhancements are you uh, adding over in the next five years? Okay, so uh, Mark, thanks for asking those questions. Um, the, the answer is yes. Uh, we don't have a rigid revenue model. We adapt our revenue model to what the norms are for the marketplace that we're selling in. Uh, why not? We want to be adaptable. We don't want to pro provide barriers to doing business with us. That said, most of our customers want per unit licensing. So for instance, if you're, uh, our proposals to the car companies uh, are based upon how many cars we put our voice system into. And the more cars they put them into, uh, the lower the price gets. In that marketplace, they also want yearly maintenance and support. And very typically, they also want some customization. Uh, so we have some, uh, some revenue at the beginning of the project to make that customization for them. Uh, we did, uh, at the other end of the spectrum, uh, the proposal for the banks in Germany, uh, so they had 20 branches that they wanted to put characters in to talk about financial services that the bank offered. Uh, you know, sometimes when you're in the bank and you're waiting in line to uh, speak with the teller, uh, they, uh, their idea was you'd put these characters there to sell you additional services. So I think it's a good idea. They wanted to be on a SaaS model, which by the way, is more typical for vending machines and, uh, and kiosk displays where the vendors of those um, systems charge on a monthly basis. Uh, that means us amortizing um, uh, our development costs and revenues, typically over a, a two to three year period. So that's also a very viable way for us to sell product. Once again, we wanna make it easy for our products. Oh, by the way, for trade shows, uh, our pitch to the trade shows is if we put one of these at your trade show, it's free. But typically what the trade shows do is turn around and sell um, sponsorships and uh, and our goal is to do revenue sharing with those trade shows. So it's another creative way of getting our product out there and generating revenue. Awesome. 
looks like we are out of questions uh, at the moment. This is, we have 10 minutes left. Does anyone have, you know, their, those burning questions that they've been wanting to ask before making this investment opportunity? Today is, you know, the day to get those questions answered. Um, I am going to add the Start Engine uh, raise page link again here in the, in the chat. Um, that raise page has a lot of valuable information, uh, has a lot more information than we can speak on in this webinar. So if you would like to learn more, please visit that raise page. Uh, this webinar is recorded. I know that was a question that was being asked earlier, but yes, it is being recorded and we will be posting it on the raise page. Um, David, is there anything else you wanted to add? I know there was a video uh, from the trade show you wanted to, to show. Oh. Yeah. No, so I, I totally forgot to mention that. Thank you for bringing that up. Sure. Um, so you know, last uh, last week the team was at an automotive show. Uh, while that marketplace is slow for us, uh, we've invested a lot of time um, right from our very beginning to um, uh, to selling to the automotive market, and we want to maintain those relationships until they start buying again. So we were at the the tech crunch mobility show in San Mateo last week. And uh, let me show you, here's some videos from my phone. Um, let's see. So this is uh, uh, Emily on our team uh, talking to, uh, actually, I don't know who she's talking to, but you can see it was a very uh, busy trade show that was automotive focused. And we're busy uh, out there um, exploiting every opportunity that we can to meet new people and to fan the uh, the coals of uh, past relationships that we've invested time in developing. Uh, also, so you know, we regularly do outreach uh, with our customer base. We have about 10,000 contacts uh, that, uh, th that are in everything from automotive to robotics to consumer products, where we stay in touch with them on a regular basis and let them know what we're doing. Uh, so, um, do we have any other questions out there? We don't have to go the full hour. Uh, I, I know all of you are uh, have busy days and have invested a lot of time with us already. We do have three more questions that, that just came in. Okay. We do have a question from Nancy. Uh, I know we talked a little bit about, about the trade shows. When is the next trade show that you mentioned and um, where is the trade show? So the next trade show is next week in Santa Clara. Uh, if you're not familiar with the area, it's right in the middle of uh, Silicon Valley. And uh, the show is called AWE. So if you want to Google, just uh, uh, type in AWE show and you'll see what it's all about. Uh, now, this particular community builds applications for, um, for the new glasses, uh, for goggles, uh, for virtual reality experiences and game experiences. And it's not just for games, but uh, there's a lot of corporations that are using these technologies for training, for marketing, uh, for all different ways of, uh, that they interact with their customer bases. So it's, uh, th these are important tools that, that we're making for them. Um, other shows that are coming up, uh, uh, the summer is usually a slow time for shows. Uh, we're talking about doing shows in, in uh, LA in July. Uh, let's see, we just got invited uh, to another show in September. And then we've got three shows that we're looking at for October. So uh, we, we have a busy calendar. Uh, we're also busy looking at new shows. Uh, for, what are new shows for us uh, that are facing the advertising industry and the digital signage industry? Uh, luckily, I have a brother-in-law that sells digital signage, so he's helping me uh, find the right shows to uh, to produce uh, to show our products in uh, and make business. Um, thank you for asking that question, though. Uh, what's number two there? Um, if someone wanted to reach out to you to discuss opportunities for collaboration or commercial licensing, what is the best way to do so? So this is a little unusual, as I understand it. Um, my door is open. My email address is david at sapientx.com. And uh, uh, we, I'll put it into the chat window for you. I already did uh, that for you, David. Oh, th thank you, Khalil. Oh. I appreciate that. So my commitment to all the investors is uh, 
first of all, we value your participation and uh, we value your questions. And even more, we value it when you help us connect the dots and make business connections. And you'd be surprised at how many people do just that. So uh, don't be shy. If you think that, uh, that your brother-in-law over at XYZ Company might be a good fit for our products, yes, make an introduction, please. Uh, we have a lot of doctors that, uh, that have invested and uh, they've been making introductions to us to uh, uh, their health team. Uh, one of our investors is in South Florida and has a psychiatric department at a major hospital there. He made connections. Uh, there's, uh, there's a lot of that going on and it's a very healthy thing. Um, the other part of my commitment to you is I'll respond within 24 hours. Uh, I drop a ball every once in a while. I'll apologize in advance, but I try really hard to get back to you quickly because uh, it's important. And for this question, we don't have to go too deep into it, but it is asking, Juan is asking, after the Start Engine campaign, where are you going to raise funds and will there be a higher valuation? We can't really answer the second part, but I think we can dabble into the first part of that question. Yeah, so um, the answer is, uh, is unclear. Uh, now, traditionally, companies like uh, startups will work with seed investors to help get the company going and to begin selling product. Traditionally, uh, then they go to professional investors, VCs, and raise a, a series A round, and if necessary, a B, a C, a D round to help them grow. Um, that's the normal approach, and we may well follow that normal approach. What's important, though, is uh, most of these companies don't go to a Series A until they have uh, 500000 or a million dollars of yearly revenue uh, from sales. And we're not at that point. Working hard with the team to get us to that point. I've done other companies that have gone through that growth curve and had uh, uh, achieved those sales figures in the past. We know how to do it. We just need to get out and sell uh, what we think is a good product. Uh, so it's very likely that we would follow that with um, going to our friends in the venture community. And by the way, uh, we've been getting ready for that day for a very long time. Our first presentations to the venture community happened in the first year that we were formed. Now we knew they weren't gonna write a check, but we see this as a long-term relationship. And we wanted to find out who in the professional investing community uh, were interested in what we're doing and typically would invest in companies like us so we wouldn't waste our time later. Uh, I like, uh, for instance, people like Tim, Mayfield, uh, Tim Chang over at Mayfield. Tim came from the game industry and really understands what we do. Uh, Mayfield is a top venture firm, and we would be really lucky to have him on board as an investor later when we're ready. Um, we have a number of such conversations. Uh, I just saw Yoon Choi, who used to be one of the senior investment advisors over at SAIC Capital, and now she switched over to another firm. I've had her and her daughter over to the ranch to play with the chickens and the, and the, the, the sheep. Uh, we see this as an ongoing relationship. They know us, they know what we're doing, they see us over time. So when the time is right to tap them to invest in us, we'll be ready and hopefully uh, do that in, in an efficient way and really get the, the best investors behind us to help the company grow. Uh, is any of that a sure thing? No, uh, future's written in, in, in the wind right now, but we're making, hard, uh, making the right steps, I think, to, uh, to make all that happen for all of us. Thank you so much for that, David. We are at the top of the hour here. Um, David, any final words, any send-offs that you'd like to, to say right now? I wish you could understand how, how excited I was about uh, what's going on right now. Um, I, I told you at the beginning that I'm a little tired. It's, <laughs> the other day I worked 17 hours in front of the computer, uh, uh, which uh, 
didn't feel like work at all to me. I, I, I love doing what we're doing. And something like these characters are over my shoulder. Part of the reason I'm, I'm excited about it is we've been working on them for five years to bring them out to, uh, to consumers. Next week will be our first time that we do that. I hope some of you can come to the show. If you can, we're at booth 819, or you can just ask Sander and he'll tell you where I am, hopefully. And uh, uh, we're just tickled that we're finally getting to do this and begin selling product in this area. Uh, I want to thank those of you who have invested with us already. That is so important to us. Uh, those of you who are uh, have their checkbook out and are thinking about this, I hope we tilted the balance and you're going to write uh, uh, a big fat check today because that's, that's, that's going to help us along our way. So thank you all for taking the time to uh, join us in the call today. Khalil, thank you for emceeing and uh, arranging things. Yeah, definitely. And thank you everyone for attending today. This webinar is recorded, so if you missed it, uh, don't worry. We will have a copy of it for you. Um, but you know, please feel free to follow that Start Engine Raise page. Click that follow button on the top right corner and stay up to date with SapienX. Hope everyone has a great day and have a safe Memorial Day holiday. Take care, everyone.